Good morning. So I want to talk about coupling in NMR spectroscopy and proton NMR spectroscopy. And specifically, what I think we'll do in today's lecture is use coupling constants, understand, get a better understanding of spin-spin coupling, and use coupling constants to help determine stereochemistry and regiochemistry of a couple of compounds. In other words, get an idea of how coupling constants can help us in better understanding molecular structure. So we were talking about spin-spin coupling before, about splitting. And I gave examples. I gave a molecule. We've talked about a couple of examples. And I said spin-spin coupling generally occurs through two or, two or three bonds. And certainly the simplest example you get from the beginning of sophomore organic chemistry might be something like an ethyl group. And I've drawn this molecule before as sort of my archetypal sketching of an NMR spectrum. So let's take chloroethane as an example. And you would expect the NMR spectrum. We've sketched the NMR spectrum in the past. Here's our PPM scale. You'd expect the NMR spectrum to look something like this, where you see a quartet in a 1 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio just downfield of 3 parts per million, and a triplet in a 1 to two to one ratio, just downfield of one parts per million. Now, a typical coupling constant, or what we more specifically call a vicinal coupling constant, a three bond coupling constant, is about seven hertz. That's a good number to keep in mind for an SP3 system. So I'll say typical vicinal Vicinal is like vicinity, nearby, coupling in a SP3 system is about, so we'll say J, the term that we use to describe coupling constants, approximately equal to 7 hertz. In other words, the little magnet generated by this proton here affects this proton here by about 7 hertz. Collectively, you have three little magnets. We talked about how you have three, four different spin states for the methyl group, all spin up, two spin up, one spin down, two spin down, one spin up, all spin down. Collectively, that gives rise to this quartet in the 1 to 3 to 3 to 1 pattern. And the distance separating the first two lines and the second two lines and the third two lines is 7 hertz. In other words, this distance, I've written my sevens very small, the distance between any two lines is 7 hertz. So the overall peak is 21 hertz wide. Ditto for this triplet. Coupling is mutual. If the methyl protons split the methylene protons with 7 hertz, the methylene protons split the methyl protons with 7 hertz. In other words, the separation between these lines here, between each of the lines, is 7 hertz. Again, I've written that very small. I'll write that larger up here. That distance is 7 hertz from one side to the other side, we're about 14 hertz wide. And that's the most common form of coupling you see because in general, vicinal protons in general are different from each other. Remember we said coupling has to involve protons that are different from each other, that are not the same. In many cases, a CH2 group 
is the same, so these two hydrogens don't split each other because they are the same, they occur at the same chemical shift. The three hydrogens of the CH3 group don't split each other because they are the same. But in cases of diastereotopic protons, those two protons are different, they appear at different chemical shift, they will split each other. The example that we looked at in class was this derivative of phenylalanine, and I put up a handout, I put up an actual spectrum of the phenylalanine derivative, and we looked specifically at the two diastereotopic protons, and we saw a pattern for each of them that was a doublet of doublets in an ABX pattern. We saw the pattern line, 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 where one proton gives rise to one doublet of doublets, DD. The other gives rise to another doublet of doublets. Now normally, these outer lines would be the same height as the inner lines, but if the two are close together, you get what are called non-first order effects, and they sort of lean inwards like this. So when they lean inwards like this, we call this an ABX pattern. An AB pattern is what you would get if it was just a doublet and there weren't another coupling partner, but you have a coupling partner here, that's our X, it's far away in chemical shift. That proton appears split by these two protons. These two protons in turn each split each other as well as the proton over here. The pro coupling to the proton here, I'll call this HX and I'll call this HA and HB. The coupling to the X proton is about 7 hertz, that's a vicinal coupling, might be a little bit more, a little bit less depending on the conformation, maybe 6 hertz for one and 8 hertz for the other. But the coupling of proton A to proton B, that's a two-bond coupling, and a typical Geminal, geminal is like twins, right? You have these two protons twinned onto a carbon. A typical geminal coupling in an sp, so geminal is two bond coupling in an sp2, in an sp3 system is usually J of about 14 hertz. Geminal couplings tend to be really sensitive to substitution and particularly to hybridization. In just a moment, I'll show you a geminal coupling of 2 hertz to give you an idea of the extreme. Vicinal couplings also are sensitive to substitution and hybridization, but not quite as sensitive. I'll show you vicinal couplings of 10 hertz and 18 hertz, or 11 hertz and 18 hertz in just a moment. So the, if we call the lines 1, 2, 3, and 4 here, the distance between lines 1 and 2, and that's the same as the distance between 3 and 4, that's our 3-bond coupling. J3HH, that's a way of saying the three bond coupling, so that's about seven hertz. And the distance between lines one and three, and that's gonna be the same as the distance between two and four, that's gonna be our two bond coupling, J2HH. So basically, HA can feel the spin of HB and HX. Those spins can either be up 
One can be up, the other can be down, B can be up, X can be down, or B can be down and X can be up, or both can be down, but since the coupling constants are different rather than the same, you get four lines for those four spin states. So we have, we get this four line pattern called an, uh, a doublet of doublets, and because it is near in chemical shift to the other doublet of doublets, we get the ABX pattern. Thoughts or questions? All right, I want to give you a couple of more typical coupling patterns and then we can sort of play with these and use them with some real data. All right, so another useful one to keep at your fingertips is what happens with sp2 hybridization. So in an alkene, you also have a three-bond coupling, you also have a vicinal coupling, but now you have sp2 hybrid carbons, and the J values are typically different. So your typical cis coupling in an alkene, your J is about 10 hertz. Usually you get a range from, say, 7 to 12, depending on the exact compound, but 10 would be a good typical number. A trans coupling in an alkene is typically maybe J of maybe about 17 hertz, and the numbers would range from maybe 12 to 18 hertz as sort of common values. So the, the spin-spin coupling occurs through orbitals. In other words, this proton feels the spin of this proton through orbitals. The electrons in this CH bond overlap with this bond here, which in turn overlap with this bond. In general, an anti-periplanar relationship leads to bigger couplings. And so the trans coupling, where you have this 180 degree relationship, leads to better overlap. And so you have a bigger, bigger interaction, about 17 hertz, as opposed to about, seven, about uh, 10 hertz here. You see the same thing in sp3 systems. If you have two hydrogens that are locked in an anti-periplanar relationship to each other. So say over here, if I give you this example of tert-butyl cyclohexanol, this coupling where you have a 180 degree dihedral angle is about 10 hertz, whereas this coupling, so this is axial-axial, here you have an equatorial proton. Here you have a hundred. Uh, you have a sixty-degree dihedral angle, much less good orbital overlap. Here your J value is typically about three hertz, and this is very useful in being able to analyze stereochemistry, because by the coupling pattern of this hydrogen, you could immediately tell if the hydrogen was axial and the OH group was equatorial or if we had a diastereomer where the OH group was axial and the hydrogen was equatorial. All right, so I want to give you one more example with alkenes, and I'll give you a geminal coupling. I've already hinted that geminal coupling is much lower in, uh, or different in sp2 systems. So a typical alkene geminal coupling for a typical alkene here, J is about, um, say, 2 hertz would be a typical value. You might see ranges from 0, zero to 2 for a typical alkene.
Thoughts? Yeah. So how come the uh, general one is lower in size? Are they share the same? Like, uh, the orbital overlap is almost good on You know, you've got a really interesting question. The question is, why is it so small? in the gem, why is the coupling constant so small on the sp2 carbon? And conversely, you'd kind of say, well, this makes sense. It's 14, it's bigger. They're closer, they're, you know, two bonds away versus three bonds in the sp3. Why is it so sensitive to hybridization? I don't have a good answer to that, to that question. I could probably wave my hands and talk about overlap I suspect that the overlap really involves an overlap with sigma star with the antibonding molecular orbital, and you may have a lower angle to the antibonding molecular orbital, but I'm waving my hands on that, to be honest. Other questions? That's a great question, one I just wish I knew the answer to. If, if you had a J value of zero, you will not see splitting. And many couplings, so I'll talk in a moment about long range couplings, couplings involving four or more bonds. Most couplings involving four or more bonds are less than one hertz. Less than one hertz is very hard to pick up. Below about seven tenths of a hertz, you basically run into limits from the uncertainty principle. And even, even at 7 hertz, well, maybe even 0 0.5, 0 0.3, you'd run into limits from the uncertainty principle. But even at about 0.7 hertz or 0.5 hertz, you run into practical limits from digital resolution. So for all intents and purposes, 1 or maybe 0.8 or 0.7 is the smallest coupling that you can pick up. Below that, you don't see splitting. If it's like 0.5 hertz, you might see ever so slight fattening of the line. But yeah, so if we didn't have, if J were zero with the right substituent, it might be, you would not see splitting. They would each be singlets if they were distinct. And if you're shimming, which is an adjustment of the magnetic field, homogeneity is a little bit off your line width will be a little bit higher, and you may miss the small couplings. Hopefully you wouldn't miss two hertz, but you might miss 1.5. All right, so let's take a look at an example and see what we would expect. See what we would expect to see, and then I'll show you a real spectrum of it. So let's take a look at an example of Tert-butyl ethylene, or perhaps to give it a better name, 3,3-dimethyl-1-butene. Uh, and let's label our hydrogens A, B, and C, just reflecting, giving them three names so that we can tell what we'd expect to see. In fact, I think I'll use, since I use capital for the name of coupling patterns, I think I'm going to use lowercase. I'm going to give it HA, HB, HC to avoid confusion. All right, so HA has a trans relationship to HB. So they should split each other with about a 10 hertz coupling. HA, up. Uh, has a cis relation. HA has a cis relationship to HB. They should split each other with about 10 hertz coupling. HA has a trans relationship to HC. They should split each other with about 17 hertz coupling. And HA and HB have a geminal relationship. They should have about a 2 hertz coupling. So if you want to diagram or think about how this would look for HA, you would expect it to be split into a DD, a doublet of doublets, with J is equal to 17 and 10 
hertz. And I could sketch that out by making a little splitting tree diagram where we imagine, of course, splitting occurs all at once, but you can think of it as occurring sequentially. HA is split by HC with a big J of 17 hertz. And the lines are further split by HB with a J of 10 hertz. And so you get a four-line pattern, a doublet of doublets, where you get line, 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 line. This way of thinking sequentially is the same way of saying, OK, HA can see both HB and HC spin up. Or it can see HB spin, um, spin down and HC spin up. Or it can see HC spin down and HB spin up. Or it can see both spin down. And the net result then is that if we call our lines 1, 2, 3, and 4, that 1 to 2 and 3 to 4 are going to be 10 hertz, and that 1 to 3 and 2 to 4 are going to be 17 hertz. Now, if I were measuring the coupling constants, what I would do would be I would take, since there's always experimental error, I would take the distance between lines 1 and 3 and the distance between lines 2 and 4 and average them and report the hertz to the nearest tenth of a hertz. And then I would take the distances between lines 1 and 2 and 3 and 4 and average them and report them to the nearest tenth of a hertz. So I might report 17.0 or 16.8 and, you know, 10.3. Thoughts or questions? Coupling is mutual. So if HA splits HC, HC splits HA, or, or if H, well, and vice versa, and if HB splits HA, HA splits HB. So if we wanted to look at HB, we would expect HB to be split with a 10 hertz coupling. And then our geminal, we'd expect it to be about 2 hertz. So our HB, again, would have a pattern of four lines. But now our pattern would be a DD, J is equal to 10 and 2 hertz. And HC, in turn, would have a big J of 17 hertz. I always call the, big, the bigger J in a coupling constant big J and the littler J little J. So big J would be 17 hertz, which I've tried to match to my drawing on the other side of the blackboard. And then we'd have our splitting of 2 hertz for B to C. And so we get a doublet of doublets that looks something like this. Thoughts or questions? So we're going to see how we did at this point. And one of the things that I, that I love is the sigma 
Sigma Aldrich catalog, the Sigma Aldrich website, has all sorts of different NMR spectra on it. And they're all available to download, so I often use them when I want nice examples of real spectra. So I got the spectrum for this very compound, and I blew it up so that I actually, we actually could get J values on here. And I'll tell you a little trick that I did. Let me see. I think we have enough. I think, I think we can see that okay without. Should I dim the lights or are we okay? What's that? All right, I'll dim them a little bit. All right. That should work a little better. Okay. So one of the things that I like is the spectrum actually can be manipulated because it's postscript, it's, li it's, um, it's line art. So I can actually go ahead and stretch and shrink the scale. Now, I, they don't give a peak printout, but this is done at 300 megahertz. At 300 megahertz, one ppm is equal to 300 hertz. And so by just taking this scale here and shrinking it and split and expanding everything, I was able to make a ruler. So here we see our spectrum of tert-butyl ethylene. And that's just what I had up on the blackboard, our spectrum of 3,3-dimethyl-1 butene. Except now, instead of looking at a prediction, we're looking at real data. So you've got your tert butyl group over here, and then you've got your alkene region over here. And I expanded that alkene region from about 5 to 6 over here. And you can start to see your doublet of doublets. In fact, you can see a doublet of doublets over here. And that corresponds to HC. That looks essentially like the pattern I drew on the blackboard. And then these two are close to each other. But again, the human mind is very good at recognizing patterns. And you can see one doublet of doublets over here and another doublet of doublets over here. And so this is our HC. What? Oh, I'm sorry. This is our. HA, and this is our HC, and this is our HB. <clears throat> and then what I did here was continue, I manipulated the scale to make it into a little ruler accurately. And so we can read off our Hertz values. And so you can see the difference between line 3 and line 4 is 11 Hertz. So this is 11 Hertz. And the difference between line 2 and line 4 is 18 Hertz. And so we're able to actually measure our coupling for HA. And HA is a DD, J equals 18, 11 hertz. If I had a more accurate ruler, I'd read it out to the nearest tenth of a hertz, which is about as accurate as you can get. So we can do the same for our HC. And it looks like our distance here is about 2 hertz. And it looks like our distance here from line. So that's our distance between 3 and 4. And our distance between lines 2 and 4 is about 18. So for HC, we have a DD. 
j equals 18 to hertz. It doesn't surprise me that within the limits of experimental error, I get exactly the same value for the 18 hertz. Coupling is mutual. Now, if I could read to the nearest tenth, maybe I'd get 17.9 and 18.2 or something, which wouldn't be a significant difference because they are identical. But right now, because I can only read to, to the nearest tenth of a hertz, to the nearest hertz, they are 18 and 18 and 2 and 11. And if we do the same for our HB and we go ahead and analyze that, we get that we have a DD of J equals 11 and 2 hertz. Thoughts? All right, now why is this useful? Why are we talking about this? All right, well, there is information that you can get from coupling constants, from coupling patterns. So imagine for a moment that we did the following reaction. Let's say we had phenylacetylene and we treat it with HBr, and we get bromostyrene but we want to know if we get cis or trans or a mixture. This is a perfect question for NMR spectroscopy because the coupling constants are going to tell you the answer. And on the next uh, slide, on the next uh, panel right below at the bottom of your page, I've shown you the actual sample that Aldrich sells. Now, bromostyrene is important to me because we use it in our Chem 160 class for the Suzuki coupling. And in the past, I've had, had the TA synthesize stereochemically pure the trans bromoalkene so that students in the Chem 160 class can then do a Suzuki coupling and make a pure stereoisomer of a diene. It's a lovely experiment. It's actually a heck of a lot of the work for the TAs to do a synthesis on about an 80 gram scale for bromostyrene, we would love to be able to buy it from Aldrich. And in some years, I don't know this past year what they did, but in some years they have. So this is what we get when we buy it from Aldrich. And if you look at this spectrum, you start to see something. We've got two sets of peaks, right? The question is, do we have the trans or the cis. Now, phenyl, pH, right, a benzene ring. Benzene protons often are lumped together at about seven parts per million. And so all of the phenyl protons, right, all of the benzene protons are lumped over, over here at about seven parts per million. There's one of the, um, I think there's one of the homework problems where they even talk about, oh, don't even try to analyze a simple phenyl pattern. But then we've got a couple of more peaks here. We've got a couple of peaks here, and we've got a couple of peaks out here. Can you see those patterns? What do they look like? What does that peak look like? It looks like a doublet. And 
All right, I haven't gone and put a ruler on this particular spectrum. You actually, of course, have an example of what 10 hertz and 18 hertz look like from your couplings over here, right? This distance is 18 hertz. That distance is 10 hertz. So you get a little bit of a calibration. But even if you didn't have it, remember that a coupling, that at 300 megahertz, 1 ppm is 300 hertz. So 18 hertz is 0.06 ppm. And 10 hertz, well, 9 hertz is equal to 0.03 ppm. So we've got a doublet here, and we've got another doublet here. In fact, they look like a pair. And you can tell that they're going together because you've got a doublet, and it's an AB pattern. In other words, it's leaning in. And then you've got another doublet that's an AB pattern. <clears throat> and although I don't have a nice tight scale, that looks like a pretty big J. That looks like about 0.06 ppm rather than 0.03 ppm. And what really gives this away is we look here and we see another doublet and a mate over here for that doublet. And those doublets are far closer together. In other words, these doublets look like they're maybe 0.05 ppm apart. These look like they're maybe 0.03 ppm apart. These look more like they're I don't know, 15 or 18 hertz. These look more like they're 10 hertz or thereabouts. And again, I would measure them if I had an actual spectrum that I wanted to work with. What do these two sets of doublets tell us? What do they tell us about the, the, styrene, the bromostyrene sample at Aldrich cells? It's a mixture. Which is the predominant compound? The trans is the major compound. Those big peaks correspond to the trans. I'll call that T for trans. And the small doublets correspond to the cis. Daniel, your head is spinning. Thoughts? Yeah. Why are they so far apart though? Like when we looked at this one, like the initial doublets and the doublets, like it's like this is quite far apart up there. Why are they so far apart? That that is a fantastic question, and I have an idea about that. All right. Here's, here's, my, here's my thought. So my thought on this is <clears throat> in the cis compound, the phenyl group would like to be coplanar, but it can't be coplanar because if it were coplanar, it would bang into the bromine. So my guess is it goes out of planarity. My guess is that makes the ring current of the benzene shift this proton downfield more. So my guess is basically this proton sits, over the, uh, sits in the area of a big ring current. The ring current is the same, same reason why these protons shift downfield. You get a big magnetic anisotropy, and my guess is this is shifted downfield 
by the ring. I think it's a conformational difference. That is a big difference for in chemical shift for two protons on an alkene, but it's in no way surprising. I often see protons at eight parts per million for an alkene or seven-ish. Remember, I said five to six is sort of a range. Other questions? All right, so last thing. I wanted to use this compound for lab class, and I can get a read here of the heights, how much we go up, and it's pretty coarse. It looks like we go up about 1.0 units in the integral on the trans compound and about 0.02 in the cis. So in other words, we have about a 5 to 1 ratio. If I were able to have the scale a little bit bigger, I could put a ruler on there. But it's about a 5 to 1 ratio of trans to cis. Yeah? Uh, on, the, on the two sets of doublets, of doublets um, why is one side higher than the other? Why, ah, brilliant question. Why, why is one side higher than the other? All right, that brings us to our next issue of long-range coupling. So, there are very small couplings beyond 3 hertz. And if those couplings are big enough to affect the peak, but not big enough to be picked up, that region under 1 hertz I talked about, like 0.5 hertz, then your peaks get a little bit broader because they're split, but so little that you can't see it split, which means they get a little bit shorter. So this doublet is a little shorter due to what we'll call benzylic coupling, as is this. And that brings us to long-range coupling. So, okay, long-range coupling. So that's four or more bonds. Long-range coupling typically is um, let's say less than or equal to 3 hertz, usually zero, usually too small to see. But in cases where you have double bonds, unless, so unless there are sp2 carbons. And in some cases with sp2 carbons, you will pick up four bond or in some cases even more coupling. So here you have four bonds and this coupling in what's called an allylic coupling on a double bond, four bond coupling, is let's say um, typically maybe a J of about 1 hertz. You usually can pick it up. Depending on geometry, it can be 0 to 3 hertz. On a benzene ring, you have normal ortho coupling. So ortho is vicinal coupling. Your J is usually about 8 hertz. Let's say 6 to 10 as a typical range, but you also have metacoupling, and that's also four bond coupling, and your metacoupling is typically about 2 hertz, let's say typically maybe 1 to 3 hertz. And the case that we have here usually is too small to see as specific coupling. 
So what we're seeing here is benzylic coupling and that's usually less than one hertz. But it is enough to ever so slightly broaden out this peak here and I think if I were to zoom in on this cis proton, I think we would see it actually split, which is kind of cool. All right, so with these couplings in mind, let us imagine the following. Let us imagine that we took phenol and we treated it with nitric acid and sulfuric acid to get dinitrophenol. And what I've done on the flip side of your paper is to show some different regioisomers of dinitrophenol and I'd like us to figure out which one is which. All right, so I've drawn out several possible candidates and I've given us three spectra. And I'm gonna start us out on this one by showing us one of the answers. So the first spectrum here, this was a problem from my graduate level midterm course, uh, my graduate level course midterm. The first problem here, we have two five dinitrophenol is spectrum A. It's the first spectrum. And let's look at the patterns. These are again the Aldrich spectra taken on 300 megahertz NMR spectrometers where one part per million is 300 hertz. A hundredth of a part per million is three hertz and 0.03 parts per million is 9 hertz. So, if you look at our pattern, we've got a doublet, we've got another doublet, but with a much smaller coupling constant, and we've got a doublet of doublets with a big coupling constant and a small coupling constant. All right, H3, H3 is a proton that only has one coupling partner. Paracoupling is very, very small. So H3 has an orthocoupling to H4. And that gives rise to a doublet with a J of about 8 hertz. In other words, a sizable J. H6 is a proton that has one coupling partner and it's long range coupling, it's metacoupling. H6 is coupled to H4, but that coupling constant is much smaller. It's just a couple of hertz. And so you see H3, you see H6 over here. And H4, gets two coupling partners. H4 couples to H3 with a big coupling, an ortho coupling, and to H6 with a little coupling. So H4 is this double.
So the, the coupling constant is the difference between the position of, the question is, what do I look at? I look at the position of one line, I look at the position of the other line. If I had a ruler in hertz, I'd be able to exactly measure that difference. But that difference looks like it's maybe, it's not a tenth of a part per million. It looks like eh, maybe a little less than half a tenth call it about 0.03 parts per million. In other words, it looks like it's about 9 hertz. These two lines are really close together. They're not a tenth of a hertz. They're much, or not a tenth of a ppm. They're much closer to a hundredth of a ppm. Now remember, we don't have much of a ruler, but the distance from 8 to 9 is 300 hertz. So I have a little bit of a calibration here that's 300 hertz, and so even though I didn't slap a ruler on it, I can say, okay, that's a little bitty coupling constant. That's just a couple of hertz. So that's what I mean. That's what I'm measuring. And what's nice is now we've calibrated ourselves because now I put all these spectra on the same scale. Now we know that distance is about 8 hertz. That distance is about 2 hertz. So now, even though we don't have a ruler on the scale, we're calibrated in our mind's eye. If we had an ethyl group in there, remember I said 7 hertz on an ethyl group, 7 hertz on a typical sp3, sp3 coupling, you'd have your ruler from that ethyl group and you'd be able to eyeball it. But I've started us out here and now I can, we can eyeball it. 8 hertz, 2 hertz. So look at the next spectrum and let's figure out who it is. Okay, the next spectrum is really in interesting. What pattern do we have here? A doublet. What pattern do we have here? Triplet. What's the ratio of integrals? What's this ratio to that ratio? We have a triplet and a doublet. The triplet is in ratio 1. The doublet is in ratio 2. For the ratio, I don't know, we go from, this is about 1.7 to about 2 point, about um, 2.4, this is about 1.3, eh, close, close enough to call 2 to 1, maybe this is, looks like maybe this is 0 0.8, 0 0.8, so about 1, this is about 2.6 I'd say, my best eyeball, 2.6. That's about 1.3, so it's about a 2 to 1 ratio. All right, so our molecule most likely has symmetry, and there are no metacouplings in it, only orthocouplings. Which molecule of the remaining molecules has symmetry and only orthocouplings? 3, 3, what? 2, 6. Ah, here we go. Symmetry and only orthocouplings. And, okay, H3 and H5 are symmetrical. Remember what I said, protons that are the same don't split each other. So H3 and H5 don't split each other because they are equivalent. All right, final spectrum. What pattern do we see? What's this? Doublet with a large size J. What's that? With a much smaller J. And what's this? Doublet of doublets with a large J and a small J. In other words, we have an orthocoupling and a metacoupling of the remaining molecules. Which one fits the bill? 2,4-dinitrophenol.
And so you could imagine that if you took an NMR spectrum, if you did an electrophilic aromatic nitration of phenol, and you took your NMR spectrum of the crude product, just like we did with the mixture of isomers of bromostyrene, you could immediately analyze the multiplets based on their couplings and their relative sizes and say, I have a mixture of this dinitrophenol, that dinitrophenol, and maybe some mononitrophenol in there as well.